All right. Well, uh, welcome, uh, and thank you all so much for uh, coming out here this afternoon. Uh, from what I understand, uh, this is the uh, most exciting thing that is happening in Boston today. Uh, <laughs> so we understand um, uh, your, your your interest in coming. Uh, uh, no, in, in all seriousness, we're we're grateful for your presence, and uh, we're really uh, thrilled uh, for this event. Uh, and uh, we, we've been able to assemble uh, really an all-star uh, panel here uh, to discuss. Uh, something that is uh, current, and by current, I mean just in the news today. Uh, if uh, if you watch the headlines, uh, the state of New York or the city of New York, one or the other, just sued uh, Exxon Mobil. Uh, so uh, this is definitely a uh, uh, present uh, and pressing topic. Uh, my name is Joel Nolet. Uh, I am on the steering committee uh, for the, uh, the uh, Federal Society's Boston Lawyers Chapter. Uh, and. Um, it's, it's my honor to uh, sort of uh, get to play host of sorts for the evening. Uh, one thing I do want to flag for your attention uh, is that uh, on Monday, we will actually be right back here uh, in upstairs in the press room, from what I understand, uh, and uh, Attorney General Sessions uh, is going to be here uh, giving a talk, uh, and we'll be having lunch. So if you haven't seen that, uh, please be sure to uh, sign, up, sign up for or ask us about it, and we'll be happy to provide more details. Uh, I am uh, I am going to keep my uh, introduction short. Uh, I am, however, going to introduce Lindsay De La Torre, uh, who is going to serve as our moderator for the evening. Uh, Lindsay is the executive director of the Manufacturers Accountability Project, which is a project of the National Association of Manufacturers. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, Lindsay will introduce the rest of the panel. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out, uh, given the rain and the World Series. Um, we'll try not to keep you here late. Because um, I know you have uh, pressing um, things to get to, but um, in particular, I want to thank the um, Federalist Society for um, hosting this, um, and Joel, in, in particular, for all your hard work in putting this together. Um, we have a fantastic um, group of panelists, um, so thank you for your time uh, here tonight. Um, I know it will be a great discussion. Um, before we begin, I sort of want to give a high-level overview of where we are um, in the litigation. I know. Um, our panelists will fill in the gap, and they are each going to take um, 10 minutes at the top to um, give their perspective, so I won't speak long. Um, but just to frame the issue, to date, 14 municipalities and one state have filed public nuisance climate lawsuits against en energy manufacturers, including in California, Colorado, New York City, Washington State, Rhode Island, and most recently in Baltimore. Essentially, these lawsuits are seeking damages from energy manufacturers for public nuisance claims related to the effects of climate change. These cases are in various stages, but I want to highlight the most recent uh, developments and decisions. On June 25th, U.S. <coughs> District Judge William Alsup dismissed the suits brought by San Francisco and Oakland, holding that, quote, the problem deserves a solution on a far more vast scale than can be supplied by a district judge or jury in a public nuisance case. He also wrote that, quote, all of us have benefited. Having reaped the benefit of historic progress, would it really be fair now to ignore our own responsibility in the use of fossil fuels and place the blame for global warming on those who supplied what we demanded? And on July 19th, U.S. District Judge John Keenan dismissed the lawsuit brought by the city of New York. And in his opinion, he explained that, quote, the immense and complicated problem of global warming requires a comprehensive solution that weighs the global benefits of fossil fuel use with the gravity of impending harms. To litigate such an action for injuries from foreign greenhouse gas emissions in federal court would severely infringe upon the foreign policy decisions that are squarely within the purview of the political branches of the U.S. government. Accordingly, the court will exercise appropriate caution and decline to recognize such a cause of action. While these suits are working their way through the courts, I also want to highlight a few related cases, including a 2009 suit brought by the Alaskan coastal village of Kivalina that used similar logic to sue energy manufacturers. In Kivalina, an appellate court ruled that the federal action by the EPA displaces their claim. And of note, two plaintiff's attorneys who argued these cases are also attorneys arguing the appeals for the city of San Francisco, uh, Oakland, and New York. Uh, in 2011, a Supreme Court case titled AEP versus Connecticut, and I know several of our panelists are experts um, on this case, um, in an 8-0 decision authored by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, 
the court held that corporations cannot be sued for greenhouse gas emissions prim primarily because the Clean Air Act preempts uh, these claims. Um, I will note, um, as Joel mentioned, in a, a timely uh, development today, uh, attorney, acting Attorney General um, in New York filed a lawsuit against Exxon uh, claiming that the, the company defrauded shareholders by downplaying the expected risk of climate change to businesses. Um, I know that will be um, a, an interesting um, topic uh, for discussion here today. Um, the suit was brought uh, by, uh, using under the Martin Act, um, a state law that gives her power to investigate and prosecute securities fraud. So with that, I will pause. Um, you know, I think here we are left with what, what, all, what all does this mean for um, litigation in this area and where do we go from here? Um, I know the, uh, that our panel has a lot of great insights. Um, so with that, I will take a minute to introduce them and then we will get uh, started with the debate. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Stephen Ferry. Uh, he's a professor of law at the Suffolk University Law School here in Boston, where he teaches both environmental law and energy law. Professor Ferry has published multiple editions of environmental law, examples, and, ex and explanations textbooks. I feel like there's a few of his students maybe in the audience, uh, and he's written exten <laughs> extensively on the subject. I mean, they get an automatic A, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Phil Goldberg. He's the managing partner of the Washington, D.C. office of Shook, Hardy, and Bacon as well as director of the Progressive Policy Institute Center for Civil Justice. Among his relevant ex expertise, Mr. Goldberg has offered briefs in AEP versus Connecticut, uh, which is the case I just mentioned. Um, next, we have Don Cochin, uh, who is the Parker S. Kennedy Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development at Dale E. Fowler School of Law at Chapman University. Uh, Professor Cochin is also a visiting scholar in residence at the Center for Constitution at Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Cochin has written extensively in law reviews, op-eds, and blogs on the subject that we're discussing today. Next, we have James May. Um, he's the Distinguished Professor at, of Law at Widener University Delaware Law School and co-founder and co-director of the Dignity Rights Project and the Environmental Institute at Widener Law and an adjunct professor of graduate engineering and former chief sustainability officer at Widener University. He's litigated hundreds of public interest environmental claims across the United States in both state and federal courts and wrote the law professor amicus brief in AEP versus Connecticut. Uh, finally, we have uh, Ken Reich. He is an experienced lawyer with a nationwide reputation and, practice and his practice focused on environmental law. Prior to forming his own law firm, he spent se seven years in the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, first as a trial attorney, then as an assistant chief, as well as working at a number of law firms. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Boston University School of Law, where he teaches environmental law. So, as you can see, we are very lucky to be joined by this distinguished group, um, and I will pause and hand it over to Phil uh, to start us off. I'm going to stand up for the lectern if that works for folks. Sure. Um, my name is Phil Goldberg, as Lindsay said, and um, I'm a, a public policy attorney, which generally means that I work with my clients on the larger liability issues like this rather than work with them on the, uh, in, in specific litigation. Um, and so uh, this is an issue, and these are a set of cases that I've been following that for a number of years. Um, I, I first met Professor May, I, I can't remember exactly how many years ago, but I probably come up here in 2012. Um, we were at a Valparaiso University Law Review s Symposium on these cases, and uh, we all had our, our good works published, so I happened to bring it with me. I uh, figured maybe uh, Professor May will sign it over to me and give me his good autograph on it. Um, to set the, the, the stage a little bit for this dialogue, um, you know, I know we've got, some, we've got some practicing lawyers here, we've got some law students here, um, maybe with some tort professors in the room, so be careful how you answer this, but who knows what a tort is? Does anybody want to? Right. So if I were to sell you this pen, the mere act of selling you this pen, would that be a tort? No. I wouldn't think so. You don't know what's in that pen. <laughs> <laughs> is the mere act of selling a gallon of gasoline a tort? That is really what this all is about. Um, in all of tort law, um, what you're, what the common links of throughout that run through all tort laws, there has to be wrongful conduct that 
caused some sort of compensable injury. And in the tort of public nuisance, which is what all this is about, all this litigation is being filed under, the question is, is there wrongful conduct? Um, and in order to answer that, you have to look to see if there's an unreasonable interference with a public right. And so selling a pen or selling a gallon of gasoline is not, in my view, and those of the of courts that have ruled on this, an unreasonable interference um, with a public right. It's not wrongful conduct. Because what the companies are doing here, as, as several courts have, have, have explained, is that the, all they're doing is selling the fuel that we all want and need to fuel our cars, to heat our homes, uh, to turn on our lights. And so um, then if, to, if you kind of run through the other torts, like whether negligence, there's no tort duty not to sell these products, these aren't, there's no design defect, these are, this is a, a, you know, release of carbon dioxide is an inherent aspect of a natural resource. Um, and there's no causation let, and, it's, and even traceability in these cases to any one company's product or conduct um, because this is about 150 years of, of carbon dioxide being um, uh, accumulated in the atmosphere um, over, you know, around the globe and again over 150 years. So it's not caused by any specific regulation, corporate conduct, or even any type of fuel. And it also doesn't have the hallmark of what we look for in tort law which, when we're trying to regulate behavior through tort litigation, which is this is what you're doing that's causing you to be liable. This is why we, that's why it's based on wrongful conduct and here's what you can do to not be liable in the future. And so <coughs> there is nothing that in, the, in this litigation where you would say, here's what, the, uh, what, what these companies can do to not be subject to liability going forward, other than not to sell fossil fuels. And so if there's no legal basis for this litigation, um, then what is this litigation all about? And it's really about politics. Um, it, the, the plaintiffs and, and the communities that have brought these have expressed that they're trying to um, advance a political agenda against fossil fuels. They're frustrated that there's not enough um, occurring in Washington, frankly, um, and they want, um, and they're hoping that the threat of liability and massive liability uh, can bring industry to the table. And so you had the first wave of these lawsuits were brought when Bush was the president in the early 2000s. And these were AEP, Comer, Kivlin, and General Motors. And all of them were lawsuits against private companies and utilities over the sale and use of fossil fuels. Uh, they, w each case was, pa was packaged slightly different from a legal perspective and kind of a combination permutation of how public nuisance cases can be brought. But they're essentially all the same and the motivations were the same. The Maine Attorney General said, it's a shame we're here trying to sue companies because the federal government is being inactive. Uh, the plaintiff's lawyer in Comer said, our primary goal was to say to defendants, you are at risk within the legal system and you should be cooperating with Congress, the White House, and the Kyoto Protocol. And so the first wave of cases, um, as Lindsay mentioned, um, failed. Uh, in AP versus Connecticut, it was rejected unanimously in, the, in an opinion written by Justice Ginsburg. The technical ruling was, a, was about displacement, but she didn't stop there. She went on to talk about this is an issue of national legislative uh, authority, that judges are not equipped to be, in her words, a super EPA, uh, and that there's no parallel room for tort litigation. And the other cases, the circuits that were hearing similar cases at the time, got the message loud and clear. And the Kivalina in the Ninth Circuit, uh, Ninth Circuit wrote in Kivalina that it would be incongruous to allow the litigation in any of these other t forms. And the Comer uh, judge said that, you know, acknowledged they're doing nothing more than lawfully engaging in their respective spheres of commerce. So then you have the second wave of cases uh, that are going on um, over the last couple of years. And that's, th there's an attempt to really trump up the, the, um, the, the wrongful conduct element and try to make salacious allegations. That, uh, but it, what it boils down to, and, and as the, the judge in, in Oakland, Judge Alpsop said, it, it's really that the allegations are these companies knew about climate change and they still marketed and sold their products for use anyway. Um, and that they should have been trying to facilitate a transition away from fossil fuels to renewables. Um, the remedy was not as outwardly as regulatory as, say, AP versus Connecticut. It was this, they say, it's all about money. We want money for local projects like seawalls uh, and other things that have to be done in order to protect against the, uh, the impacts of climate change. 
Um, and so whether it's seawall in Imperial Beach or New York City, I submit that building seawalls and making energy companies pay for them has as much to do with climate change as Trump's wall has to do with immigration. These are purely symbolic in nature, and they're meant to drive media, not necessarily to deal with the, subs the underlying substance. And what, there's an environmental lawyer, and I'm sure I'll, I'll mispronounce his name, and maybe one of the, uh, the folks here uh, know, uh, Dan Reisel or, or Riesel. Um, Rizal. Rizal. Um, he was uh, involved in, in framing some of these litigations and said that the pleadings were intentionally written like press releases. He said, quote, we have to take private action because the party that should be regulating the environment is doing jack. That was his words. Probably cut off a little bit too soon. <laughs> so the, uh, as Lindsay said, in Oakland, um, Judge Alsop, who was a Clinton appointee, uh, called the, the, it a sweeping proposition that otherwise lawful and everyday sale of fossil fuels combined with the awareness that greenhouse gas emissions lead to increased global temperatures constitutes a public nuisance. Um, he said that the question of reasonableness, again, we go back to you know, it's unreasonable interference with a public right. He said the question of reasonableness falls squarely within the type of balancing best left to Congress or diplomacy. The New York City case focused a lot more, the judge there really focused on the, in, the national and international implications of regulating CO2 emissions, saying it, it would, quote, be illogical to allow this city to bring state law claims when courts have found that these matters are areas of federal concern that have been delegated to the executive branch as they require a uniform national solution. And then the third set of cases, which, as, as we heard, there's been development today, um, it, where the New York Attorney General or Acting Attorney General sued ExxonMobil under the Martin Act, really is about some of the same conduct issues that are at issue in these tort litigations, um, but uh, the state AG there is saying that um, it was securities fraud to not be honest with the um, with shareholders that um, that the, the the climate change could have an impact on Exxon Mobil's business of selling fossil fuels. And a corollary to that, there's Massachusetts Attorney General filed a, a, um, a civil investigative demand a couple years ago to investigate the same type of, of questions. And uh, ExxonMobil has uh, a petition pending uh, with the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to step in uh, and try to uh, stop that civil, investiga civil investigative demand. And the issue there um, is really all just about jurisdiction. Can this, the state of Massachusetts, do they have jurisdiction over these national, international issues when the conduct that they're alleging didn't necessarily take place or have a, have an, a sufficient connection to the state of Massachusetts? So what's the Massachusetts role in all of this. And um, so in, in conclusion, and, and I, I'm really looking forward to hearing the remarks of, of the other folks here, really, I'm sure, dive into some of these issues in a lot more detail. Um, you know, being in Boston it reminds me of Secretary Rice, who was Clinton's uh, labor secretary. Um, no, no relationship. <laughs> He, um, <coughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure you're just, you're equally as smart as he is and equally as, uh, no, it's, it's a tall order. He's, uh, he's a brilliant person. Yeah. Um, but he, in the 1990s, he called um, suits like this, this obviously before these lawsuits were filed, he said they're faux legislation which sacrifices democracy. He said this is not the proper way to set political or policy issues. Um, and so, um, I, you know, I would submit that this is not the way to set national energy policy. We are all responsible for the use of fossil fuels. And it's a political decision to, for, for these specific defendants to be sued. It could have been any defendant, any companies. It could have been any users of fossil fuels. There was a political decision to go after the producers of, of, uh, of oil and gas. The, the, these lawsuits try to focus our energy policy only on concerns about the environment and climate change. But there's a lot of other issues that go into setting national energy policy, from energy independence uh, to affordability, national security. And so, um, so, what, so, and these lawsuits don't let us really get at any of those other issues. And finally, I just, as, as we kind of go on to the, uh, you'll hear from the other speakers, this idea of, of litigation by localities over things like driving national political decisions or policy decisions or paying or requiring manufacturers or private in, uh, interests to pay for local infrastructure projects is really at the forefront of a trend of litigation that we're seeing in a whole bunch of different areas around the country. And so there's a lot of layers that we can talk about later, but there's a lot 
uh, uh, that is at stake, I think, in these litigations and how this de debate gets played out. So with that, Lindsay, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thanks so much, Phil, for your insightful comments. Thank you also for staying at 10 minutes. <laughs> did I? Um, you did, you did. I'm, I'm keeping time over here. Um, next we have Professor Ferry. Um, if you'd like to, to give us your insights, we'd appreciate it. Okay, we've like got to seat? switch this computer. I've got okay. to uh, unplug this. back up. Let's see. Did we get an assist up here? Is it going to come up? I don't know. No? Okay. Give away your password. I know. <laughs> this will not be on the test. Right. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can get this thing running and we'll run here. Okay, so I'm going to diverge. I thought I might be going a little bit uh, later, but... Uh, Okay, now we can move along. Um, I'm going to diverge from this entirely and let others talk more about the case. And since I'm uh, going earlier rather than later, again, there are a large number of lawsuits, more than a dozen. They are uh, concentrated in California, um, which for a later slide makes, uh, makes some difference. And the bases here are, A, that there's no jurisdictional basis to bring these suits. They're non-justiciable, which means this should be the executive branch politicians deciding this, not individual judges with juries or without juries. Uh, displacement, which I'll go into more in a minute here. And also, interesting issues come up in each of these two opinions that have been rendered as to why are you suing the oil companies for making a product as opposed to the people who put it in their cars and their furnaces and burn it, which is an interesting <coughs> aspect. So anyway, the courts, um, again, I'm going to go very quickly because I've brought more slides than I have time to show, but uh, basically two Supreme Court cases at the bottom, the Ouellette and the Silkwood case, uh, basically say that common law claims survive federal regulation. And Kivalina was mentioned. Um, again, let me skip over because others are going to talk about uh, Connecticut versus AEP. Let me skip over that. But in the bottom of that chart, again, the Third Circuit and the Fourth Circuit, for example, are split as to whether common law claims are or aren't pre preempted. Nuisance claims are common law claims. So it's still, at least in the lower courts, somewhat in dispute. Here's the difference between displacement and preemption. Displacement is basically a horizontal or lateral um, pushing out one level of our balance of powers. It says basically if the Environmental Protection Agency regulates something, yeah, the courts do not have a role in regulating it. It basically displaces um, the, um, the role in that way, so among federal branches. So again, when the federal government occupies the field, the common law is displaced. Preemption is more vertical. It says the higher level of government, if it acts at the federal level, preempts or supersedes, I'm not going to use the word trumps, supersedes <laughs> the, uh, the uh, lower state level common law regulation. So I'm going to go through these. I'm not going to, leave, I'm going to let others talk about this, but just note this is the California ruling. Uh, just one or two of the things I've bolded because um, we have so many speakers. Um, again, they did not bring the claims against the emitters, which are you and me who drive and take subways and do other things. They tried to attack this worldwide, not so much for carbon in the U.S., but carbon <coughs> internationally. Uh, there's no U.S. jurisdiction outside the U.S., which is an interesting sidebar. And um, uh, again, uh, all of us have benefited. This is the California decision. Uh, the New York decision here, uh, it's displaced, it's displaced, it's extraterritorial, you're reaching outside the U.S. Um, so let me uh, skip over this for a second. So I want to diverge from this for my remaining 9.99 uh, minutes, which I still have, Lindsay, right? Um, I want to diverge here and say what is happening here. Um, President Trump is repealing our, is changing NEPA, which is the consideration of CO2 impacts on the environment, as well as uh, trying to either repeal or replace the Clean Power Plan, which is the Obama uh, administration attempt Large, uh, it's exclusively with the power sector to cut back carbon emissions from fossil burning power plants. 
Um, he was going to repeal it. Some of his lawyers said, let's replace it with something called the ACE, which I'm not sure uh, exactly what it means, but it does fit in a Twitter, so uh, it's uh, <laughs> short. So in any case, um, he is replacing it. That may be essential here in some ways. Um, let me come back to that in just a second, that he's replacing it. If he leaves a gap, interesting question I'll let others address, whether that makes some of the claims of common law active again because they are no longer displaced by the EPA deciding to be active and regulate carbon. Um, and again, it's not replaced yet. So where are we? Um, most um, articles now say we are doing terrible, terribly in meeting our international commitments uh, to Kyoto and its successor, the Paris Agreement of 2015. I want to talk about Chevron deference inter, uh, disappearing, which I think is going to make carbon regulation harder in the future before my 9.98 minutes are, are now not uh, available. Okay, so where are we on the Paris Agreement, which uh, President Trump is also attempting to pull out of? It's going to take him four years. We will have another uh, presidential election before that can be successfully done. Um, but there are a number of articles out there that tell us that carbon dioxide is still increasing. And it is increasing, but not from the United States. In the United States, it is decreasing. And so without the Paris Agreement, uh, again, let me just make this real quick. We had to hit an agreement here by 2020 to reduce 17 percent our carbon emissions, and by 2025, reduce them 26 to 28 uh, percent, which is a 300 percent increase over business as usual projections. So again, we're pulling out of this agreement, at least for now. But this, we had to hit 26 to 28 percent seven years from now, if we stay in. Um, there are a number of law articles out there. This one just came out where people are saying uh, it's rising each year. Again, that's only true if you don't look at the US. They accuse the US of this. Um, here's where we are, and I've got a graph that will say this uh, better. But we are already at 26 to 28 percent reduction seven years before we have to in the power sector. So in the power sector, because of natural gas substituting for coal, a huge amount of renewable energy coming up, we are essentially hitting our Paris Agreement uh, uh, objectives. The Obama administration clean power plan said that was only going to cost us $8 billion a year. That has been enjoined by the Supreme Court. I'll come back to that in just a second with my 9.97 minutes left uh, here on this. But um, we are basically there. So if you look at a graph, this is uh, independent research by the Rhodium Group. Uh, we are, you can see 2020 on the bottom uh, graph. Uh, we are already at 26 to 28 percent, which is in the power sector at least, where we need to be. The clean power plan was going to take us down 32 percent, only in the uh, electric power sector by 2030. Uh, and we are within 4 percent of that 12 years before we had to hit it. So the U.S. is actually doing fairly well with all of this. Uh, this is something that uh, Jerry Brown and Michael Bloomberg published two weeks ago. This is their plan as to how they think we should get there. The left bar is how much carbon reduction we need to uh, eliminate uh, climate warming from the U.S. Almost all of it is going to be that third one over with the 620 on the top. It's all power sector. So their, their view is that we don't do much with transportation, which is almost as large a share as electric power. We don't do much with our homes, which are a smaller but a significant impact. We're going to just keep leaning on the power sector to well, it does it all. Um, it's going to be harder now because of three Supreme Court decisions that I will very quickly uh, go through to enact this legislation going forward, no matter which administration is there. So um, again, um, uh, Trump administration is deleting consideration of CO2 in NEPA statements. Um, they are also stopping counting international benefits of carbon reduction uh, and what are called co-benefits. Most of the reductions of the Obama-era uh, programs were beca not because they reduced carbon, but because they caused coal plants to shut down, which decreased other pollutants that are regulated under other parts of the Clean Air Act. And again, I'll take questions on that if people have them, but in the interest of time, let me just sort of state that as a, as a given. Um, there are three Supreme Court cases, and how am I doing on time, by the way? You have 9.99 minutes. Fantastic. <laughs> I feel like the guy in the ad who talks really quickly for Federal Express or something. Okay. So anyway, there are, there are four recent Supreme Court cases that I think make it extremely difficult for the EPA to regulate for carbon, and I think they fundamentally change Chevron deference, which is the foundation of administrative law out there. Um, 
So again, there's a 2014 decision. I've got multiple slides on this, but let me just use this as a summary and we'll skip over them which follow this. Um, there's a decision, these are all uh, pretty much EPA or Federal Energy Regulatory Commission cases. They're all Supreme Court cases. Um, I've got articles out there if people want more information about them. On the first one, the 2014 decision, EPA tried to tailor a regulation that was basically a carbon directed regulation. And they were supposed to regulate a large number of emitters for carbon, uh, for, uh, for mercury and carbon. And so what they did instead is they said, well, we're going to discard regulating 99% of them because it's too much of an effort for us. And that was um, held by the Supreme Court that the EPA can't fudge and use its discretion to change what the statute says. Again, these decisions only affect EPA in theory. Then in 2015, an important decision for a couple of reasons, Michigan versus EPA. I know we have a new Supreme Court justice uh, as of about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, he was the dissenting opinion on this in the D.C. Circuit. The Supreme Court five to four reversed and adopted his opinion. In his confirmation documents, he said it was one of the 10 most important things he ever did in life. I think the rest were drinking beer, but uh, <laughs> I won't say too much about that. So he, he, is, he, he is certainly believes uh, that this is an important decision. That was uh, a an, an decision where they overturned an EPA regulation where EPA refused to look at the costs compared to the benefits before issuing the regulation. Again, this is on coal plants. That's largely carbon and some other pollutants. Uh, they did not say how the EPA had to consider costs, but arguably now the EPA cannot promulgate a regulation perhaps unless maybe the costs are justified by the benefits. In the EPA programs, if the Trump administration removes consideration of international benefits and co-benefits, the programs go from being very highly cost effective to zero cost effectiveness. All the benefits are either international in the Clean Power Plan, for example, or co-benefits of regulating what's called particulate emissions uh, from shutting down the coal plants as opposed to the carbon. I know that sounds like a lot of moving pieces. The 22nd 20, 2015 uh, decision in Virgi West Virginia versus EPA is something the Supreme Court has never done in anybody's lifetime in this room. The Supreme Court shut down the Clean Power Plan, which is our carbon uh, control mechanism out of the Obama administration before it ever had a case before it. Uh, the case had not been decided by the D.C. Circuit where it was. Um, the D.C. Circuit refused to enjoin the program during the Obama administration uh, pending appeal, which was going to take a year or two. Uh, th there was an appeal on that refusal to enjoin to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court basically said, does anybody know in this room to the, to the uh, attorneys arguing whether we've ever done this before and nobody could think of a situation. And they shut down the clean power plan on carbon before the case had even gotten to the D.C. Circuit and certainly before it had gotten to the court. And they didn't just shut it down by reversing an opinion. They said the entire program can't move. Um, so that is interesting uh, in relation to carbon. And then there's also a case, Hughes versus Tail and Energy, uh, that's a, uh, not an EPA case, but it is energy related, where s individual state action, and again, these are state suits, to try to control uh, certain electricity, uh, certain incentives for certain power plants in their state uh, was held to uh, violate uh, essentially the uh, uh, preemption clause of the Constitution. So let me sum up here. So uh, again, these are my details. One minute. I, so that, it's, in the middle, it flies so quickly, doesn't it? So with one minute, let me go past all these cases. These are more details. Let me just uh, put up this one for a minute. Chief Justice Roberts is now called our swing vote. Um, he calls, in Michigan versus EPA, not making something cost effective, uh, which these carbon regulations would not be unless you consider the international benefits. He calls it an in run around the statutory uh, language. Uh, in other opinions, he calls it it's a danger posed by growing power of the administrative state. It's uh, not uh, rational, never mind appropriate, to impose billions of dollars in costs for a few dollars, et cetera, et cetera. So let me go over this again. This is the Kavanaugh dissent that got uh, uh, changed. This really changes Chevron deference to now where there are some limits, at least on the EPA, only one agency, in using discretion to enact something. So. Um, 
Again, the co-benefits, um, basically what happens here, the cost of the Clean Power Plan was five to eight billion dollars a year. The benefits were uh, domestically four to six million. So five to eight billion in cost, four to six million in direct benefits, unless you considered something other than the carbon benefits, which is always was being regulated. Uh, a lot of the red states that are red on this map were the ones who sued, a majority of states sued under the Clean Power Plan. It was more than half. Uh, and that's been enjoined now for three years. It'll be three years in February. And nothing has moved at the D.C. Circuit. So since the Supreme Court enjo enjoined the entire program, the D.C. Circuit so far has refused to uh, issue a decision so far on the, uh, on the uh, basic things. So let me just go through all of this. Uh, so where are we on all of this? It's interesting here. I think if the Trump administration merely repealed the Clean Power Plan, perhaps that activates again <coughs> the common lawsuits not being displaced by the federal regulation. If he replaces it with something else that's much, <coughs> much less dramatic, uh, arguably there still is some regulation and perhaps these suits are still the place, displaced that others will address. So I'm going to uh, leave it for questions and answers and uh, now I'm happy if Lindsay would introduce my uh, cohorts here. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your um, insights into the broader environmental landscape. Gave, you gave us a lot to think about. Um, next, I want to hand it over to uh, Professor Kochi. I'm sorry, I gave you a, I gave you a um, yes, your turn. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you to the Federal Society for organizing this event. Thank you to Joel and Lindsay for helping to organize it and to my fellow panelists for being involved in this discussion. Um, I want to start with uh, focusing on three sort of preliminary remarks in response to Professor Ferry's presentation um, and, and just make sure that we're setting the stage for a full understanding of some of what we're talking about here. Uh, the first thing I want to make sure that people understand is the Northern District of California and the Southern District of New York both decided that climate change was real, or at least that was their determination that ultimately uh, was uh, in existence, uh, but that there w we were going through it the wrong way, right? If we want to actually solve these problems, the judiciary wasn't the right place to be. So first off, this is not necessarily a d debate over the climate science. Uh, what I'm going to talk about in part is to, to the extent any of that kind of debate in is, is involved or to the extent that you want to decide how to actually approach uh, potential solutions, that just belongs elsewhere. And that's really what those two courts were both saying. The second thing is you'll notice that, uh, although we only have 10 minutes to talk, so it's not fair to uh, make this criticism criticism of Professor Ferry, but you notice how much was focused, in fact, on administrative and legislative solutions. And in fact, much of the chart shows you the ways that, that those things might actually be helping to alleviate some of the problems that are associated with, associated with climate change. There were no charts, and I don't think you could actually come up with any charts, which actually show you that public nuisance litigation would be effective at solving climate change, right? That it would actually have an impact on it overall. So we should be asking ourselves what, in fact, is the effectiveness of the strategy behind these lawsuits. Related to that, I would ask you to pose this question to yourselves. If we trust judges to make these determinations, remember these judges determined, at least in these two cases, that climate change does exist. I don't think that, and then they decided that it wasn't the right venue, that instead it should happen elsewhere where we solve these problems. What if those courts decided to rule that climate change was fake? Climate change was not real. Would we trust judges to be making that determination? They close out the political debate by making a judicial determination that we are supposed to respect somehow, that in fact there is no climate science which can justify regulation. If that were the case, I think people would not be trusting judges. Yet that is a perfectly possible outcome when you place it in the hands of a non-deliberative body in which you don't have electoral checks on their behavior. So you need to be careful about trusting judges because they can go against you as much as they can go for you. Uh, the third thing is, is uh, where my, the focus of my uh, uh, point, uh, w points will be, and that is that no matter whether or not uh, we have a displacement theory here or not, um, I think that there's a po potential for actually damaging the institutions by trusting the judiciary to do some of these things. And that's where I want to uh, focus much of my talk. Themes about largely uh, what is the comparative institutional competency of the, of the um, respective branches that can address this, and then secondly to debunk the idea that um, that common law actually captures or should capture this kind of evolution in legal standards. So first ask yourselves, what's the appropriate role of the judiciary? What's the appropriate role of courts in a system of separated powers? Many of you know the, 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 the uh, typical federal society chants that in fact judges should say what the law is, not what the law should be. And in fact, that uh, is embedded in Federalist Number 78, where uh, 
Hamilton says, whoever attentively considers the different departments of power must perceive that in a government in which they are separated from each other, the, judici the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution because it will be, have the, it will be the least in a capacity to annoy or injure them. The executive not only dispenses the honors but holds the sword of the community. The legislature not only commands the purse but prescribes the rules by which the duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated. The judiciary, on the contrary, has no influence over either the sword or the purse, no direction either of the strength or of the wealth of the society, and can take no active resolution whatever. So the idea here is that judges, in fact, should be involved in adjudicating disputes, but not necessarily deciding, or should not be involved in deciding uh, the appropriate uh, uh, regulatory space. So what is the appropriate role for the legislative and executive branch? This, these are the branches which we know do policymaking best. They are in a policymaking role. They are the ones who are deliberative bodies. They can evaluate competing scientific evidence. They can take evidence into account. They can look at uh, different arguments, and they can decide between them. They can look at and consult expertise, and they can bring their own expertise to bear. It's a form where debate can actually occur in a way in which you can have contested issues of social fact, or you can have uh, uh, contested issues of how to address those social facts best and, 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 to, and to balance the competing interests. That's, in fact, why the judges were, in fact, deferring to those legislative branches to make these decisions in, in the case that we've seen so far. So in a system of separation of powers, it takes all that into consideration and requires that we choose lanes. We have to choose the lanes in which individuals are going to operate. There are formalistic requirements to, in, this, in this lane choice uh, idea uh, to see the structural limits of where the judiciary should be. I've kind of talked about the structural limits. Judges do this. Legislators do this. But functionally, I think that there are also separated limits as well. The separation of powers is not just about strict walls. It's also about who does things best. And that's what I'm talking about when I say comparative institutional competency or comparative institutional advantage. When we have a problem to solve, who should we trust to solve it? We should ask those who can solve it best to do that. Um, in that sense, among the ways that you apply this test is to first ask who is better equipped, what branch is best uh, designed to handle the problem or make the choices, which branch, and then secondly, which branch is most susceptible to the following things. First off, which branch is most susceptible to accountability for the choices that they're making? Secondly, which branch is most capable of being monitored for the choices they're making? Third, what, what branch is most subject to corrective action? That is, if they make a wrong choice, how do we get rid of that? If a judge decides there's no climate change and makes that determination in, in a ruling, how are you going to, what, what are you going to do? Where's the corrective action for that judge that makes that determination, right? But you can make that corrective action in the legislative branches, the electoral branches. We have the, the electoral check overall on, on, on different, different behavior. And in, in fact, um, so far, um, uh, you know what, I, what, I've, what I've been talking about is the issues of climate change and how they should be handled. Um, I, I think you can then move to a, a little bit of a discussion on uh, how, how precedent is consistent with those choices. Uh, the AEP decision is, is one of those, and, and I think you've had an introduction to that. I think that's probably going to best be uh, ferreted out in large part in, in the, in the intra-panel discussion later on. The second is you, you have to realize that we've done this in the past. When we've had a need to address these kinds of problems like uh, air pollution, in the 1970s. We had a huge problem in the 1960s and 1970s with air pollution. We came together as a country and decided we needed the Clean Air Act. We came and had compromised, deliberative debate. There were, the, the, the legislation is designed to be balanced to look at competing interests. We can debate whether or not it effectively did that, but that was the process chosen then. You did not hear about any, uh, you know, you did not hear <laughs> broadly about a litigation strategy to accomplish those goals. It was seen that this was the best way to do it, and that indeed is where we should be uh, directing uh, most of those energies. Now, um, with that said, um, I, I want to I move to just for a moment of why courts are particularly ill-suited to, to adjudicate these cases. Um, uh, and and in, in part to do that, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, why some have said that common law is the right way to go in this. And indeed, there is, there is a, a bit of a uh, claim that common law is the best approach to overall uh, uh, allow for the evolution of the law, and that, that conservatives and libertarians have long called for common law environmentalism to solve these things. And what I want to spend the last you know, half, three quarters of my time doing is talking about why uh, that doesn't really work here. Instead, what we have is environmental advocates have attempted to appropriate the common law as a, as a, as a as a uh, label that they are using for the the more top-down approach through the judiciary that's that's being designed through these through these lawsuits. The first way that the common law is then being used is to justify these causes of actions, and then the second uh, way that that label common law is being used is to 
entice people to go along and believe in it, right? And I think you've actually seen some very interesting uh, uh, coalitions developed with like the Niskanen Center talking about the common law and others uh, saying that this is, this is the way we should go because regulation is bad. Legislatures are bad. We should trust the judges to do this instead. But the problem is we're not talking about the same common law that in the libertarian tr tradition would have called for common law environmentalism. That common law, the one in the libertarian tradition, is a common law that uh, facilitates private ordering, not one that disguises public uh, ordering as private. The traditional common law is bottom up, not top down, and it, it, it involves uh, you know, some strict limits overall. Few, uh, let, me, let me start with the common law of public nuisance and a few words on that. First off, public nuisance itself as a doctrine has never had a, a coherent uh, overall uh, uh, well-developed definition. I, would, I, I know that a lot of people want to adopt the restatement definition, but even there the restatement is, is, is not saying that this is a widespread um, uh, overall uh, acceptance of, of public nuisance on a, on a widespread basis. <laughs> Uh, but the, even if you look at the cases themselves that come across over time, there's a relatively incoherent uh, approach overall. Judges that do rely have never been able to develop a, a coherent definition of what public nuisance is itself. It was, it's not, never been robust in the common law. Uh, and that, in fact, uh, should be one caution that we take into account, especially when a non-robust doctrine in the common law is now being asked to do tremendous amount of work and expansion in one fell swoop. If it never was a fully robust doctrine in the first place, how can it possibly possibly be justified to the expansion to the extent that, that uh, uh, Phil was talking about a, a moment ago to encompass these new, uh, really unprecedented claims. And then, as I mentioned, public uh, nuisance has, has seldom been used. To the extent that public nuisance, nuisance has been identifiable across time as a standard for liability, the first, it, first it's not meant to be widely, dis, uh, not meant, meant to apply to widely dispersed harms. Um, not widely dispersed towns with countless contributors. Uh, this was not the intention for public nuisance over time. It was instead meant for harms which were spe specific, identifiable, and you could find out who in fact was the uh, person to which you could allocate the liability. Um, it was not meant to sort of swoop up and say that uh, you could get uh, uh, people without, uh, w without, by relaxing those standards. The second is it requires proof of uh, pre-existing and knowledgeable and noble duty. That is that you had a duty to act in the first place um, to uh, prevent this activity, to prevent these kind of harms that were identifiable, which means that it had to be a pre-existing rule. It couldn't be something which is made up after time. Public nuisance even then recognized that the individuals who were claimed to be liable for the public nuisance had that pre-existing duty. The next is that um, uh, public nuisance was designed as uh, a way to overcome collective action problems. That is, you still had to meet all the elements of proof uh, in it that such as what Phil was talking about in a traditional public nuisance action because public nuisance was m merely meant to solve a problem in which an individual could have brought a claim in the first place but couldn't wouldn't do so uh, and it was in the public interest to allow for the public nuisance claim to go forward instead that individual would, would have had to have made all those proof standards and so we can't relax the proof standards because the public nuisance doctrine never intended or never anticipated such a relaxation of, of those of those of those standards and then the last thing I'll say about public nuisance specifically before I move to common law more generally is that public nuisance uh, was seldom used to vindicate public rights. And Jim Huffman, Professor Jim Huffman, uh, has, some, has some documented work on this in which the idea of public rights, this idea of something shared by the public generally without this individualized component where proof was necessary was seldom a way in which the common law traditionally recognized uh, public nuisance. So in the end, broad public policy is better left to the legislature. The common law uh, uh, public nuisance doctrine uh, uh, should not be carrying that weight. The, um, so let, let me finish with my, my last few minutes just uh, with a few points that I'd like to have a discussion on about common law more generally. The first is that um, you'll often hear these common law claims as, as this is just an evolution of the common law over time. I think it, it would, take a, it would be, take a huge leap in evolution uh, for us to go from what I was just describing as traditional public nuisance doctrine to where we are today. Evolution is meant to be slow and gradual and that's how, the public, uh, that's how in fact the common law has developed over time. The, the common law also evolution also includes deciding uh, a, a number of different things. One thing is that the common law can decide when things don't belong in the courts. So part of common law evolution can be to defer to the legislative branches, to decide that this is actually not well suited to common law development, but instead legislative and regulatory approaches are better suited to that. That's one reason why I believe the common law here, in fact, has over time decided these public nuisance, which are really legislative-like matters, police power kind of matters, have been so scarce and have, been, have, not, have lacked a coherence 
coherent theory, in part because in, in the end, judges have, 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 not, have been reluctant to apply public nuisance in large part because they understand that it's better suited to the legislative function. The second is that we live in a system of, of, a, of constitutional separated powers, uh, which, which takes us a little bit outside of even the traditional common law, and that we have to cabin the evolution of, of common law uh, along the way uh, as, as a result of that. Um, so why generally do these lawsuits uh, represent an opportunistic and historically uh, flawed vision of the common law? Uh, just a couple uh, final points on this. The first is that the common law evolves, that's true. But as I noted, it does not evolve radically and not retrospectively to create unfairness. The common law has evolved over, uh, over time, but it's done, it so, it's done it bottom up. It establishes mostly default rules based on shared principles that themselves have come to be accepted and that have mutually benefited uh, the, the uh, parties uh, that, that are pushing for it from the bottom up uh, and that has benefited them prospectively. That is not the case in which we have unilaterally one set of individuals wanting to dramatically expand the common law uh, in, in, a, in, in a rather uh, quick fashion. The traditional common law is not a system in, in that way of these top-down rules. The second is the evolution of the common law is subject to, to a constraint against disrupting settled expectations. Here, this activity has always been legal, as, as Phil was pointing out. Uh, this was not an activity in which anyone understood they had a duty to uh, not be selling these products. And so uh, this idea of settled expectations, there was a settled expectation that this was a legitimate lawful business. And now you are trying to say that retrospectively it is no longer something uh, which uh, could be conducted legitimately and lawfully in the past, right? It requires us to rewrite history and rewrite the settled expectations. The third is that the common law is constrained by a fairness constraint. That is that we cannot apply common common law principles or expand common law principles in a manner that would be unfair to the parties involved. As uh, Justice Holmes once pointed out, tort law's concrete rules, quote, quote, tort law's concrete rules as well as the general questions addressed to the jury show that the defendant must have had at least a fair chance of avoiding the infliction of harm and must be judged by average standards to blame for what uh, he does. And he's talking about what he does at the time he did it. And so that general idea of fairness uh, is, is, is key here. Um, and uh, the, 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 the last thing I'll say is other essential necessary minimum standards for uh, fair adjudication and for, rule, for the rule of law um, and, and how you bind individual action also were considered as constraints on the development of the common law. So to the extent that these are violating those constraints, this would not be an appropriate expansion of the common law. One constraint is that there be causation requirements, another is traceability, another is allocability, that it means the capability of being allocated. The next is that you, that you actually have allocation to the right parties and, do, and the right amount of allocation to the right parties, uh, which is something that's difficult to do when you don't have all the parties who are contributors global, globally in, in these lawsuits. That's something which, which can much better be done uh, by, a legislative, by the legislative branch. Uh, Non-retroactivity, which is also the same as notice. I have to have notice that I was doing something wrong before you can tell me that I'm now liable for having done it wrong. Uh, these individuals never had notice when they were doing these things. No one was telling them it was wrong. This is something which we know now, which means we can change it. We can change it through legislative and regulatory action. Um, so the last thing uh, then is that I actually think that this will, um, in fact, uh, harm the common law uh, if we were to accept the expansion of the common law in this, in this space. Why? Because it delegitimizes the common law. Individuals rely on the stability of the common law as a slow evolving uh, process and one which does not make these radical rapid changes that in, in, impose dramatic new liabilities based on uh, unknown duties. Uh, and, and that in fact will potentially disrupt uh, our, our more traditional respected areas of common law which actually are doing a lot of good work in, uh, in, in solving private ordering and efficiency problems. Great. Um, you are officially in the lead for the highest word count in 10 minutes. <laughs> I think I probably went over my 10 minutes, but I apologize for that. Um, next, I'd like to turn it over to Professor May, um, who's going to talk about, I'm sure, among other things, broader issues um, that the public nuisance case in, cases share. Well, good evening. It's uh, great to see you guys. I'm from Delaware, so I don't have a dog in the World Series fight. I wouldn't have a dog in any World Series fight, except I will say that some of the players on the Red Sox actually came through Wilmington when the Red Sox had their high A team, is what it's called. 
play out of Wilmington, Delaware for a couple of seasons about nine seasons ago. Uh, so I think you have two still remaining. Um, but I'm at heart a Royals fan. We were among the worst teams in baseball this year, but we didn't do so bad against you guys. Go figure. But I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about um, climate change and courts and constitutions and conventions and other things. But first, a few things, because I've just been sitting here soaking all of this in and you know, try, trying to listen as fast as the words are being presented um, and probably failing miserably. Um, but um, I'm just going to, I didn't have a title for my talk earlier, but right now, just sitting here, I'm going to call it, I've decided, a brief history um, of inaction. Okay, so it, it begins really with this, uh, this idea of these three things um, to, at least for me anyway, to dispel three things that I've heard from my point of view. The first is that um, environmental advocates, uh, I, I don't think that most environmental advocates or law professors or anyone who's sensible would think that the common law, the belief is that the common law is the best way to go about uh, doing anything. Um, it is a way, though. It is a way that, you know, in, in American tradition, tradition is important. We know that from the due process clause and variety of things. That's part of what it is that we do. It's a role that courts play. So I don't think anybody thinks it's best. Uh, it's better than nothing, uh, I think, is the point. The second is um, about upending settled expectations. Guys, that's the point. So the stoichiometry on a gallon of gasoline is 20, roughly. So my background is in engineering, sorry. But it's roughly 20 pounds of carbon for every gallon of gasoline that's burned. And that has an enormous impact. But here's the deal, right? Is that, or here's the, not the deal, here's what's uh, the, the, the allegation. The allegation is that the carbon majors knew. Um, William Teller, you know, the, the called the father of the um, hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller, sorry, William. William, I'm sorry. It's, it's late for me. I'm thinking about baseball. But Edward Teller, the fi father of the hydrogen bomb, um, was giving talks to uh, national oil conferences before I was born, really, before I was born. In 1960, I was born in 1962. Yes, you can do the math. Um, but uh, saying that this would happen, saying as we burn uh, fossil fuels or carbon, it will blanket the planet, and that's going to create these kinds of issues. And he wasn't a climate scientist, uh, so it was, you know, it was known, uh, and it was uh, covered up. Uh, there were lies told about it. There was deception. So uh, about this issue about not knowing it was illegal, I, I think that's based upon the principle of, of telling the truth. Um, so that's what the laws are supposed to be based upon. You know, tell us the truth. We'll make the laws. Otherwise, um, <laughs> you take what comes, I think. So I don't, I don't buy the settled expectations argument. The third is about uh, whether all these lawsuits are you know, political, like they're politically motivated. Uh, and look, lawsuits can be. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that they can never be. But um, at least in my experience, for the most part, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, sort of, uh, so to speak, in the war room, uh, there are people trying to do something uh, because the planet's melting, and it will affect you. But more importantly, it'll affect them. It'll affect your kids and their kids, and uh, there's a warming planet, and so the, so really it's out of a, it's out of passion, not politics, uh, to do something. I have a 17-year-old. What am I supposed to do? Nothing? Courts can do nothing. Legislatures can do nothing. States can do nothing. International can do nothing. For me, anyway, in the time I have left, I, I just don't buy that. Uh, like the, the Juliana case, which we'll talk about, you know, that's, that was brought by kids. Uh, and again, you know, sorry if, if it doesn't fit the dominant paradigm for the narrative that people would like to adopt, as we don't do anything. But it's not for political purposes, because they want a planet uh, that they can enjoy just as much as I did, uh, and as much as prior generations. So for them, it's not, it's not political. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's passion. They, you know, they, they, they want to love life as much as you. Uh, so, um, so here's the brief history of inaction. At least, I know there's a longer story here. Lots of people have written about it, including people in this panel. And I have now seven and a half minutes if I stick to time, if I'm the one who does that. Mm -hmm. And that is um, that um, 
you know, in 1990, I was part of a petition. I'm sorry, not, not yet, I'm sorry. In 1990, Congress amended the Clean Air Act. It's the last time it's gone through any significant amendment to a major statute other than TSCA, but uh, so Congress had the chance to address climate. It could have, but it didn't. Uh, it addressed a stratospheric ozone, um, it addressed uh, you know, permitting and a variety of other things, but it passed on climate. But part of the reason it did that is because there, you know, some people believe that the act already provided authority for EPA to address um, greenhouse gases as a pollutant. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't suffice to say that Congress had a chance and it just decided not to regulate climate. You know, there are competing points of view there. Um, but in 1998, uh, you know, because EPA hadn't done really much of anything, there was a petition uh, to, to uh, the Clinton EPA to regulate um, greenhouse gases uh, under the Clean Air Act as air pollutants and, uh, and we had an election and we had Bush v. Gore and we, I guess we won't talk about the, the political implications of that for this forum um, and the role of the courts, right? But what happened was nothing for a while. So there were lawsuits brought under the APA, your friend and mine, the Administrative Procedure Act, the most important piece of federal legislation Congress had ever enacted. And uh, it was to get the agency to answer those petitions. And I was part of that. Um, but uh, EPA eventually said, no, no thanks. You know, it's a matter of foreign policy. A, B, it, 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 courts don't have jurisdiction. C, courts shouldn't get involved. Um, D, leave us alone. No one has standing. Uh, so eventually that went up the chain, you know, the, uh, of our judicial system to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, said, yeah, you know, greenhouse gases can be an air pollutant, uh, and uh, it's, it's a reasonable construction of the statute, um, and also states, in the very least, have standing uh, to bring causes of action concerning climate change because they get special solicitude, the first time I've ever heard that expression, but I think it's rather poetic. So then we, but we didn't have much in, in regulatory terms uh, until there was the next election. The Obama, Obama administration came in, but in the meantime, um, was, this is sort of a replay, but you know, guys, eight years ago, we were having talks, some sponsored by the Federalist Society, some I was a part of, some with Justice Scalia, um, talking about the role of public nuisance causes of action, the role of courts. And uh, in the Supreme Court, You've already heard this. It just has not been very receptive, nor have federal courts been very receptive to climate causes of action. Uh, inventing doctrines like the displacement doctrine, that's invented. You know, it's, it's, it's entirely extra constitutional to say that federal law can displace the role of the federal courts. Article 3, somebody, you know, care to show me where that is. Again, there are legal arguments and policy arguments, but, you know, it's certainly extra constitutional. Uh, uh, so, so AEP? No. Uh, if states try to get out in front, uh, they're preempted. No. If states try to develop their own uh, renewable policies to, uh, to address greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you have dormant commerce clause issues. No. If states want to challenge EPA action or inaction, uh, they don't have standing. No. They can't get in. If individuals are harmed uh, or they're concerned about future generations, the people have a stake in the outcome, too, that Alexander Hamilton also wrote about. Uh, individuals can't do anything about it. No. Uh, if there's an international accord, the Senate shouldn't ratify it. Nope. You know, so where's the yes? And so common law provides, it's not really a Yelp, but it's kind of like, okay, maybe there's a, a role for courts to play because that's what courts have been doing since Marbury versus Madison uh, uh, after the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers aren't our Constitution, the Constitution is. And um, Marbury versus Madison, you know, again, I, I don't know that. I mean, that, that can be argued as being extra constitutional as well, but that's where, just as Marshall said, it is emphatically the duty and province of the courts, uh, of, I'm sorry, the judicial department, to say what the law means. So how do, how, do we, um, re, how do we reconcile that with all of this about how courts should stay out of it? We have a third branch of government. I'm not saying the plaintiffs should win, but th this thought that, that um, you know, that kids, people who are affected don't, can't even get a day in court, uh, engage in any kind of discovery, um, uh, just have a hearing about something, it just seems absurd that that's my answer to my 17-year-old. All right, so three things. Climate, um, how much time? Maybe five, four minutes now? Go for it. <laughs> um, okay, so there's climate uh, things to address. Um, that was articulate things. But for courts, commissions, 
and constitutions. So this is like the substantive part and not so much editorializing. The first part uh, is the role of climate and courts. Again, more on that, more on this later, but just to whet your appetite. Uh, there are all these things happening in this case out on the West Coast and began in the District Court of Oregon. This is the Juliana case, uh, you know, kids against the administration to try to do something about climate. So their claims are primarily, uh, uh, they're, they're constitutional and on the pub under the public trust doctrine, but the constitutional claims include that the failure to um, uh, regulate greenhouse gases uh, <coughs> violates the due process clause, that there's a fundamental right uh, to a stable climate. Now, I'm abridging things there, admittedly. Secondly, that the failure to act violates the equal protection clause. So as I'm looking at people who are perhaps uh, on you know, the earlier part of their careers and lives, um, the argument is that uh, young people aren't being protected by policies and that, that that works a rent in the equal protection clause because I was protected, but you know, you're not. Um, and uh, also there are our claims under the public trust doctrine. Now that's not constitutional. It sounds like it sometimes, but it's not. It's, it's also invented. It's just like, you know, it's, it comes from the common law. And it has a long history going back to the Magna Carta, by the way. Um, so it, it's been in, in American law as well for a very long time. This idea that the government holds certain resources and trust for present and future generations, Illinois Central, if you remember that. So it's, it's, that's not new. Um, so the Juliana case, long story short, it's a long story. Uh, case file uh, uh, against the Obama administration. The Obama administration says, hey, those kids, those crazy kids uh, from Scooby-Doo, they don't have standing. Who do they think that they are? Uh, and in any event, it's a political question that should be relegated to the elected branches under the political question doctrine also invented entirely. But this idea that there are certain kinds of causes of action uh, that where courts just shouldn't get involved because it's constitutionally committed to another branch or as a matter of kind of prudential concerns, it should be. Um, so what happens? Well, the case kind of fits and starts a little bit, but we have an election and uh, just, th just things start to get kind of roaring along the way. But along the way, the federal district court says, that, yeah, there's a cognizable cause of action. It accepts that idea and that the plaintiffs have standing. It doesn't hold that the plaintiffs win. It just says, okay, you know, under our jurisprudence, there's margin for recognizing fundamental right to a stable climate. You know, all fundamental rights under our system, because we don't have them explicitly, are, in are invented. Reproductive rights, uh, marriage, uh, uh, right to die, all of that, it's all invented under the due process clause because of the, the, the mess that the um, slaughterhouse case has made with privileges and immunities. I'll let Professor Ferry or others talk about that in more detail. But we just invent these to address these kinds of fundamental interests. So the court said, okay, we'll hear it. And the Trump administration just flipped out. Now that's quite a thing to say with the Trump administration because just day to day, however you want to describe that, it took it up a level. And it asked the court uh, to certify the case for inter interlocutory review. Uh, Judge Aiken said, no, thank you. Um, I'm not going to do that. So they appealed for writ of mandamus to the Ninth Circuit to take the case away, which is really an extraordinary measure in and of itself. The Ninth Circuit said, nah, no thanks. Uh, we don't, we, we want to let this go through the regular process. We have a, we have a judicial system. Of, and then the Trump administration went to the U.S. Supreme Court. In July, the U.S. Supreme Court said no thank you with Justice Kennedy still on the court. Uh, and also the justice who's sort of the one who works within the Ninth Circuit. Um, and then Justice, what happens? Justice Kennedy retires. We have an you know, entire situation with a judge and then Justice Kavanaugh. And Justice Roberts gets the Ninth Circuit area. So that's what's changed. So the Trump administration files for writ of mandamus again with the Ninth Circuit, goes back again before the U.S. Supreme Court, and last Friday, the U.S. Supreme Court granted a temporary stay to hear a briefing on the U.S. Uh, government's writ of mandamus petition, uh, which the plaintiffs filed. They answered it two days uh, ahead of schedule, uh, just over the weekend. They filed a briefing response, so the court will issue some kind of a ruling. And I don't know. You know, I'd be curious to hear what everyone else thinks about what the court will do with that. I mean, I have my, I have my thoughts about that, but I'll, I'll hold on to them. So that's Juliana. That's uh, climate in the courts. The second. Uh, is, uh, wait, before I'm on the second, guys, do you realize there's climate jurisprudence happening all over the world? Do you know that? Who knows that? 
So we, in other, other constitutions, most other constitutions provide for socioeconomic and cultural rights that we don't. We don't have a right to food, shelter, or even equality, or, or a gender-based equality. Most constitutions do. Uh, also a right to dignity. So long story short, courts have turned to a right to dignity in upholding climate-based cases, a right to life, a right to dignity, and holding governments accountable um, in Ireland, in the Netherlands, and Pakistan, just to give you some examples. So that's first. Second, um, conventions or in commissions. The Philippines Human Rights Commission, Philippines Human Rights Commission, um, last or two weeks ago um, held hearings in New York City on a climate case against climate majors um, to do something about climate. Again, you know, whether it's political or provided otherwise is another question, but, but, um, but it shows how there are innovative measures to try to address climate uh, that are happening all around the globe. Um, do you guys have a question back there? I'm sorry, do you have a question? Okay, all right. You got it. Okay, so that's, so that's first. So that's um, kind of work in commissions, and there are also human rights commissions in Africa that are considering climate cases, so it's not just here. Um, there, there are things happening um, all across the globe, and that doesn't even include you know, international treaties and what have you. Third, uh, also what's happening with other countries is that um, climate is a constitutional matter, which seems like a foreign idea, <laughs> literally. Um, to us, but there are eight countries that have climatized, sorry, uh, their constitutions just in the last um, decade or so. The Dominican Republic was first, but requiring the government uh, to do something about uh, climate change, to, to develop national climate policies against something that we have. Last thing, uh, when I think of these things, I think of also in terms of separation of powers and federalism and um, individual rights, sort of the, the, the vertical and the horizontal for our constitution. And I, you know, I think that there are real questions with everything about what's better. I don't know. You know, who should be making policies about fill in the blank? Uh, it could be about it could be about reproductive rights, marriage, um, abortion, um, affirmative action. You know, who, who? But it's the role of the judicial branch to to, to help figure that out. Um, so, on separation of powers, I think there are real questions about. Um, executive power too. I think there are questions about uh, judicial power and about whether Congress has authority to do this, that, or the other thing. But I tend to think that Congress does have authority. Um, on the individual rights part of it, you know, in our Constitution we have, yes, we have a political process that's, that's quasi-democratic. We're not a, di a direct democracy. We're not. Um, and we can't can talk about that separately. But we have a Bill of Rights, guys. We have a Bill of Rights we have a Bill of Rights. It's anti-majoritarian. It's put there to work against that idea that the majority rules. When you have majority rules, you have nationalism. When you have nationalism, I'll leave it for you to finish that. Um, and then last is about states' rights. So I'm, I'm standing here speaking at, I think for the fourth time in my career, at a meeting of the Federalist Society. And I'm, but I'm sitting here wondering why I haven't heard that word yet. So states have tried to do something. States, you know, Tenth Amendment, you could quote it probably, many of you could quote it. But case after case, policy conversation after policy conversation, all around. Uh, you know, these are states bringing causes of action. And again, should I go through it? No standing, preempted, dormant commerce clause, uh, should be left to international bodies, states shouldn't get involved either. So sort of no matter where we look and looking at w really, again, whether it's political or whether it's, it's about passion, um, it seems inconsistent with this idea of federalism uh, not to be having, uh, not for that not to be part of, well, that there are states, state courts, and there's common law. Uh, and that's been the role of the states uh, since 1787. So why not here too? Anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor May. I appreciate you sharing your perspectives on the motivations of these lawsuits. Being from Kansas, I also appreciate your affinity for the Royals. So, um, so to, to bring us home, I want to hand it over to Professor uh, Reich to talk about the um, uh, preemption, among other things, and to, to wrap this issue up in a nice little bow. All right, so I want to borrow <laughs> his nine minutes. Sure. That'll give me 19 minutes? Okay. Sure. <laughs> Um, anybody that wants to stand up for a second, just to stretch, please do, uh, because this has been 
you know, it should have been 40 minutes is probably 50 minutes, maybe closer we've to got, 50 we've minutes. Gone a little of over. Pretty dense stuff. <clears throat> I'm going to try to boil down what I was going to talk about. You'll be happy to know that some of the things I was going to talk about have already been covered. I'm not going to uh, go back over uh, over the ground of, of uh, already covered stuff. Uh, I will tell you that I've done a lot of work in Montana and I've done a lot of work in Massachusetts, where I'm where I'm barred now, and I was. Uh, I'm an active member of the Montana Bar because I had an energy project out there. Uh, both states have constitutions that have within them a uh, right to a healthful environment, right in the Constitution. Uh, you might not think that about Montana, you know, it's out west, it's kind of everything, anything goes, but they really respect their, you know, their nature, the, the trout streams that, that make them famous, and, and so they have that kind of a constitutional right. I was involved in one case where we wrote an amicus about that constitutional provision. I don't think it's ever really been squarely before the, the Supreme Court of, of Montana, so it's it's still an open issue. But you know, it's in the it's in the Constitution. Um, so you've heard a lot. It's a vast topic. I'm only going to cover a small slice. Uh, I'm both a practitioner. I've been practicing law for a few years. Uh, I was at the Department of Justice, so I was. Uh, involved in enforcing the environmental laws. Um, I've also been, uh, uh, you know, representing industry and private plaintiffs for a number of years. I actually filed an amicus brief on behalf of a, of a um, organization prior to Massachusetts versus EPA, arguing that there was no, uh, that, that the Clean Air Act did not have an authority to, uh, to regulate greenhouse gases such that someone could bring a greenhouse gas claim with which they did against my client. So I've kind of been on, on a lot of the sides of these issues. And, uh, and then I teach environmental law at Boston University Law School. So every year we go over the very, very complicated questions of displacement and preemption, of, among other complicated issues in uh, administrative law and environmental law. I'm going to talk about three issues. One is, um, are state nuisance claims valid now that, uh, uh, now that these cases and others are being dismissed? And Professor, uh, um, uh, Ferry has already spoken a little bit about it. I'm just going to touch on it. Second, um, there are savings clauses in the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and other acts that basically uh, preserve state, more stringent state laws, the effect of more stringent state laws versus the federal laws. You know, what's the impact of these cases on, on those, um, those saving clauses? And then thirdly, something that uh, Professor Ferry touched on, is there an argument that we're in, where an administration basically takes a section of its of its statutory authority and puts it on the table or you know uh, puts it on the shelf that that opens up a gap where the common law can come back in so let me start with whether in-state nuisance claims are viable um, I, I I think it's pretty well settled law and these two cases are not um, unique in holding that when you're trying to um, essentially regulate by the common law a, uh, an international or, a, or, or an interstate issue. Uh, and if it's, covered, if it's covered by a statute like the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, as, as the two California and New York cases are, preemption is a pretty well-established um, uh, pretty well-established doctrine. So I think you know, these cases were decided correctly. Um, that puts aside the policy issue. However, AEP did expressly say in a footnote we're not deciding today whether there's any preemption of state-only uh, uh, state actions. And so that's where we are here, is, is there some viability for a state-only action? Not an action that's looking to regulate the world or regulate every state in the country, but you know, let's say California only brought this action, or sorry, the, the plaintiffs, the, the cities only brought these actions to claim damages only in the state of California from uh, actions by the, the, the various uh, defendants only in California, sale of gas in California, let's say. Um, I would maintain that there is a long, I don't maintain it, there's a long line of circuit cases that have held that um, where you're dealing with only local laws and local effects, that the uh, state common law claims are not preempted by the, um, uh, uh, by the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, whichever it is. So um, there is a room for state, uh, state nuisance law particularly. Uh, and as I say, a long line of circuit cases have held that. Also, um, 
the Willette case that uh, Professor Ferry referred to does say that if you have an in-state claim brought against a, uh, an out-of-state source, if you use the out-of-state source's laws, then that's not preempted. If you try to use your own laws to go against a, uh, you know, a, a source on, in another state and say our laws basically control you, no, the, the Willette said no, that's, you know, you're preempted, but if you're using that state's laws to say, well, you know what, you may have a permit, but you're, you're still creating a nuisance. You, you have your air permit, but smoke comes out every day. It may be within legal limits, but, you know, I can't breathe next door to you. Um, that, um, that's still, those kind of type of actions are still preserved. Um, the kids' climate change case is an example of a case. Now it's a little bit different because it's a case against the federal government. But it's, a, it's another example of a case that, you know, that may sustain, may uh, survive all of these other ta attacks that were made against the, um, the, the California case and the, and, the, and the New York case. Also, and this is just a side note, uh, it kind of cuts the other way, but a lot of states, sorry, well, it is a lot of states, but under the, the federal laws, there's something called a permit shield that you can get under most of the, the federal statutes, RICRA, uh, uh, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the permit shield basically says if you are if your permit contains all of the requirements applicable to you, then nobody can come along and say, well, you know, there's this other requirement over here that's not in your permit. Um, you have to comply with it. But if your permit supposedly contains all the <coughs> requirements, n nobody can put a, you know, a gotcha on you. So that, that cuts a little bit against um, uh, these common law cases. The case law is mixed. The last time I checked, the case law is mixed on whether um, that really is a, is, a, is a total shield in those kind of cases. Then, um, very importantly, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act have savings clauses, and I'll read the one in the Clean Air Act, which says, except as otherwise provided, nothing in this chapter shall preclude or deny the right of any state or political subdivision, read, uh, you know, Oakland or, or San Francisco, to adopt or enforce any standard or limitation respecting emissions of air pollutants or any requirement respecting control or abatement of air pollution. So, and, and the case law here is, I think, fairly limited, but with that kind of broad language, one could argue that a state can do what they want, whether through state regulation, more, you know, more stringent than the, than the federal, or through state common law to regulate an in-state source. So you've got, you know, that's another um, indication that Preemption doesn't always doesn't always win out, and then Professor Fer Ferry re referred to this, and I, I thought this was my great idea, but he he obviously has a, a great mind, and, and we think alike. So he 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 stated, you know, what if the administration kind of pulls back or does what it's done? It you know uh, gets out of the the Paris Climate Change Treaty, um, takes the Obama uh, Clean Power Plan, and and puts it on the shelf, and and does other actions that basically indicate an approach that doesn't regulate um, greenhouse gases, even though the administration has that power under the Clean Air Act, does that then create a gap that the federal common law uh, uh, could drive into? And it's a very difficult problem. As far as I know, I haven't done extensive research on this, but I haven't seen any cases that have directly, um, uh, directly dealt with this issue. Uh, so I'm not going to, I won't speculate as to how a court would rule on it. I think it would be a difficult case to make because administrations can always change their mind. You know, how do you actually establish that the administration has totally withdrawn its authority from the, from the, uh, from the, the statute? You'd have to have, you know, extensive fact finding. I think it would get kind of messy for a court, but I think it is, uh, if, and a lot of us here represent sources, if you're a source, it's something to worry about a little bit that, um, you know, maybe that would give a, uh, uh, give a gap that people could get into. Uh, I want to refer very quickly to this kid's uh, climate change suit because basically that's a civil rights action. It's not, a, it's not an action brought under the environmental laws. It's not brought under uh, uh, state common law of nuisance. It's brought under federal civil rights action acts. And the court rejected challenges based on judiciability, standing, and so forth. So. It's a very unusual case, and all these cases are unusual, but you know, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. 
Um, my conclusion is that public nuisance law, as it applies to the states, that is the state's common law in particular, is alive and well. Uh, it has its limitations, especially when it's, it's attempted to be used as a way to regulate nationally or internationally, but within a state, I think it's alive and well, and that's what AEP at least, uh, uh, at least raised the issue of. Um, and so, you know, we're not all the way to saying that there's no common law of nuisance. We're about halfway, but, but there are these state, state actions that I think are still right. So I'm going to start, stop early. Great. Thank you, you so much. Give me credit. How much, yes, of how, course. How, how, how <laughs> of course. Yes, thank you. How long did I take? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you um, you staying within the allotted time. With the um, we are running short on time, so with the remaining minutes, um, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper quickly um, with the panelists and have a, a discussion um, about these issues and, and all that was presented um, here this evening. Um, I want to get your thoughts on two issues that I think are central to the discussion. We may only have time to get to one of them, so I'll start mm. with. Um, the first one, you know, we know this is an important and complex issue. It requires a careful balancing of the nation's energy needs, um, economic interests, um, along with environmental concerns, which we heard a lot about this evening. Um, should this issue be left to the political branches of the federal government or the courts? And I know a lot of folks have sort of talked about um, this issue, but I'd like to dig a little deeper and have a conversation. So, Phil, since you're sitting next to me, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to let you kick it off, and then whoever else wants to jump in, uh, please do. I think there's um, there are a couple of issues that I'll, I'll try to as I, as I provide an answer, at least my perspective, uh, bring on some of the the um, discussion that's been had over the past uh, half hour or so. Um, the I think there's there seems to be two two questions of that to that an, or two parts of that answer. One is is there the legal authority, and then the other is there's the institutional competency. Um, the, the legal authority, I think it, it comes down to, and there seems to be two sets of cases, one where, where you have governments or private interests suing private sector companies for climate change, and then you have suits where they're suing the government for climate change issues. And it seems to be the, the dividing line that when they're suing the government, there may be an opportunity to, for that. Uh, you know, for the courts to hold the government accountable for what it's supposed to do in that Masters versus EPA case, which uh, I think was Professor May referred to as, you know, the special, uh, special um, solicitude, solicitude um, was saying that, th that the EPA had to at least consider um, whether that, that, that CO2 was under the Clean Air Act, it was delegated, the, the, the um, authority to regulate it was delegated by, by Congress to EPA, so EPA had to, you know, couldn't ignore it, essentially. Um, that was successful. Um, but that doesn't mean that the suits against the private sector will be successful, and those all have not been successful. So I think when we look at what the role of the courts are, I think you have to look at who's being sued and for, for you know, why and for what. And then we're, when the private sector is on the, 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 you know, the right side of the V as defendants, the courts have basically shied away from that in the climate change uh, arena. When the government is on the, you know, the, the defendant side, um, there's, a little, there's uh, mixed results and, and some uh, chance to succeed. I think the displacement issue um, I about whether you know, this is, you know, whether the, the actions of this particular administration um, in retrenching uh, on the policy side it doesn't affect the displacement ruling in AEP versus Connecticut because it was simply that because Congress included it in the Clean Air Act, that is why the, the federal common law was dis, was displaced. Whether or not the agency acts on or what they do isn't really relevant to that discussion. Um, and so uh, that I think, it, you know, that, that, so I don't think there you would get around the displacement question on some of the, the, the discussion that was just had. Uh, in terms of institutional competency, uh, you know, uh, others can talk about this. I think Justice Ginsburg laid out um, pretty effective case as to why, um, you know, why there shouldn't be a parallel uh, tort litigation here. Um, the judges just 
aren't, that's not within their capacity to be the, the super EPA. So with that, I'll, I know we're, we're short on time. Yes. So I don't want to go <laughs> well, too, Professor too Reich, time. since you were, um, yeah, I will give you some time back since you gave us um, some of your time. <laughs> All right, let's see, is this on? It should be on, okay. yes. So um, in, in response to, uh, to the comments we just heard, the, the courts, the legislature, and the, uh, the executive have always been in a, uh, a, little, a little dance. You know, there, there are three separate branches of government. Sometimes the executive has been very powerful, as it was in the Roosevelt administration, the mm -hmm. Johnson administration. Some would say now in the Trump administration. Other times it's been weaker. And in each case where, you know, one branch hasn't really taken the lead, another branch has come in. And the courts certainly have the role, for instance, you know, the most prominent example is when neither the states nor the federal government were doing anything about segregation in schools, and they were not likely ever to do that for political reasons, the courts came in and, and uh, issued Brown versus Board. And to me, it's inconceivable that, that one could argue, not inconceivable, I don't think it's fair to argue, well, that's not the court's place, you leave it to the, you leave it to the states, you leave it to the feds, um, and if they don't do anything, well, you know, too bad. The courts do have a role, and, and a very important constitutional role where constitutional rights are at issue. And I would say when an executive is not doing what it should be doing, if it's actually violating its own mandates or violating the law, of course the courts step in. So I've seen this both you know, in private practice and also in working for the government, that there, there is this yin and yang between the three branches. And I think they all have a role to play, and I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, only two branches really you know, get to say what the law is, and the third kind of has to sit back and and, and and adjudicate without, you know, some input. Um, I would also say that, you know, that a lot of people have said, well, there's no room for a jury because juries always, you know, they give extravagant, extravagant um, awards and so forth. You ought to get rid of the jury. And I know a lot of trial lawyers on both sides of the, of the V who would say, you know, I trust the juries. They're common people with common sense and they, and they make good decisions for the same reason, you know, I trust competent judges to make good decisions. Um, obviously, that's why we have appeals courts if they don't, but um, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think that all of these decisions should be made at, by the legislature or the executive, particularly if they're refusing to act or if they're not stepping into the gap. Thank you for that. Uh, Professor Ferry? Yeah, I'm hiding back here behind the podium here. Um, hello. <laughs> um, you know, it, I, I think um, one of the things that Professor May said was was important, and that is, it's not so much the carbon that goes into the air each day; it's the carbon that is staying there that's a problem. This is going to outlast everybody's generation here. We are assuming that carbon lasts, CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for 100 years. Uh, Susan Solomon, in some uh, recently peer-reviewed uh, research published by the National Academy of Sciences, says, well, we haven't had 100 years to test it. She thinks it may last 1,000 to 2,000 years, in which we're all in deep, deep trouble if it stays around and doesn't dissolve in that time. Um, so, um, uh, you, know, it's, um, you know, it's something we have to deal with today, and obviously no branch of government has really uh, done much with here. There's a tremendous conflict between environmental um, objectives to deal with carbon and control that, and energy objectives. And so um, a couple of years ago, I tried to look. I, I said, you know, somebody has got to have resolved this somewhere. So the Congress has got to have said, well, do we run the power plant or do we meet the environmental objections, uh, objectives? There have been several, um, there have been several things that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which regulates our, our power sector, has called a jurisdictional train wreck. They also called that the, the Clean Power Plan that when it was when it was first promulgated. But putting that aside, uh, just here in Massachusetts, the Kendall Power Station is between Harvard and MIT on the Charles River, kind of right on the Charles River near uh, uh, Central Square. And you pass it, it's a huge building. That plant was uh, told that it was putting too much heat into the Charles River. It had to shut down. Or, or ramp back its power output at the same time by environmental regulators at the same time that the federal government said, we have to have the power, we're going to go dark in this part of Boston and Cambridge unless you keep operating. They didn't know what to do. Each agency was ordering it to do something else. Each one was fining them if they did the opposite. When you look at this, Congress has never made any resolution on anything 
between whether you follow the environmental orders or you file, follow the uh, uh, energy orders. So we think the courts have had to resolve this, right? So when, you know, we go to courts when we can't decide this. There is not a single court decision at any level anywhere between those, those issues. So this is truly a case of first impression as to how we resolve this. The Congress has not done it. Uh, there's nothing in legislation. There's no court decision that anybody can find that's ever done it. It's going to become more and more of a conflict. We're still generating 75 to 80 percent of our electric energy with fossil fuels here. It's decreasing with renewables, but it's still significant. And so if each of those carbon molecules that's being put into the air is going to last at least 100 years by common, common uh, guess, but may last a lot longer, and it's the lasting effect that holds the heat in, uh, it truly is an issue that we have to deal with. And I think we have to deal with it as lawyers. I suppose a court is going to have to do this if the Congress doesn't. I mean, where else do you go? We only, we only have three branches at last count. So uh, where do you go? Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, Professor Cochin, I know you touched on this issue in your opening remarks, but I want to give you the opportunity to uh, dig a little deeper if you'd like. Uh, sure, I'll be brief because I know that I'm probably responsible for some of our lack of time here. Um, but uh, I'm troubled with the idea that where else do we go as a rationale for determining where to go. Um, I, I think that most of the people who are bringing climate change lawsuits are probably folks who think that President Trump has done some pretty bad things on immigration. I would say that he would make an argument that, I would say that the President probably makes an argument that, well, Congress isn't doing it, so where else do you go? That involved a value choice as to whether or not you think what he wants to do should be done. Um, that's a situation in which people who choose the value choice of courts should in, in, intervene in the climate area probably disagree that the executive should pick up where Congress isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing. So if you adopt that sort of, well, the other branch can do it if, we, if, if it will advance our policy preference um, because the other branches aren't doing our policy preference, then you have to accept that for policy preferences that you disagree with. And that's the danger of assuming that the menu of options that's available to every branch is the same. It's not. And so I don't think that there are vacuums created by inaction of one branch that justify the filling of that by a branch who lacks the power to do so. And the judiciary is not a policy-making branch. So that's the, that's the, the first uh, troubling thing that I see with that. The second is inaction isn't a gap. If, in fact, there is inaction, it oftentimes is purposeful, which is as much a policy statement. Inaction can sometimes be as much a policy statement as action. And so I, I worry about the idea that the fact that saying that there's a gap to fill, the gap because it's not being filled by the branch, another branch, um, I, I think that that's a different question. Inaction itself means that we who have the choice here to make a policy decision are choosing to with not exercise the full uh, menu of options that we have. And if the courts come in and act instead, they're actually disrupting the other branch. So there's a bit of respect, intra-branch respect, that is built into the intra-branch limitations on power. Thank you. And in the very um, last minutes that we have remaining, I want to first um, give Professor May the opportunity to respond, but also open it up to questions. Um, our audience has been so patient with us, so thank you. And um, if there are any questions, please let us know. I know we're standing in the way between food and drinks, so um, we will make this brief. But Professor, if you'd like to, to make some final comments. Yeah, this has been really uh, this has been super interesting, so thank you so much. And I'm sorry I'm so cranky, but you know, I, think there's, I just think there's good reason to be. And you know, I, I just hope for better. Um, but uh, I don't think that the common law is a reaction to inaction. Um, so my, my title, anyway, was about sort of a brief history of inaction. It wasn't a justification for common law to be used to fill a gap or a vacuum. The common law has been used for a long time, independent of whether there's action or not. Um, as Ken pointed out, uh, these federal statutes that provide, you know, for pollution control requirements and civil penalties, administrative action, and so on and so forth that you're learning about in environmental law, um, have savings provisions that allow states to provide separate ways for people to be made whole again. So, um, but imagine a situation where you have, if you have companies and corporations that have, and, and it's, it's a hard word, but it's what's being talked about, you know, uh, were complicit or conspired in shifting costs to the public, to you. 
So they made more profits, profits they should have had to the extent that they did, by shifting costs to states and to individuals. To, you know, if there's sea level rise, so what? They don't have to pay for it. If there were health care costs, so what? They don't have to pay for it. Um, so uh, is, that, is, is, that, is that how the market should work? And the common law helps to address some of that, helps to make individuals whole, makes to, helps to make states whole, and that's what's being done here. Why should Boston pay for everything on its own if uh, the carbon majors knew that what they were doing would result in costs that the citizens of Boston's would have, Boston's, Boston would have to, um, have to bear? Why shouldn't those who made the profit pay for it? And for credit for Professor Reich, I should just say on this side of the table, he has just reminded us that there is a fourth branch, uh, which is the media. Uh, but, but I'm just getting something here saying it's all fake news. So who knows? <laughs> Make sure I got his point in. Uh, to the audience, um, we have uh, Joel walking around with Mike. Any questions? I'm the physicist in the audience, so my question won't be a legal one. But I'm wondering what responsibility and liability nuclear power producers might have when they ramp down their production of power, which causes a fossil fuel plant to ramp theirs up. Okay, you're looking at me. All right. So, <laughs> so yeah, coal is getting displaced uh, just for economic reasons by, by natural gas right now. Uh, six, seven years ago, coal was 55 percent of electric power production. It's double the carbon. It's uh, double the particulate matter and everything else. Uh, now, uh, we hit one month, uh, two months ago, where it was down to 24 percent. It's being displaced. Um, it is interesting because now several states, New York, uh, Illinois, and perhaps Connecticut shortly thereafter, are so trying to uh, use something called zero emission credits to support nuclear power plants that cannot economically continue to operate. This is going to shut to saying we're losing too much money. Uh, to get back into the legal issues, that raises huge dormant commerce clause challenges. That's just been to the Second Circuit and to the Seventh Circuit for Illinois' uh, program and the Second Circuit for New York's. Between you, me, and a few close friends, I think those decisions were wrong, but they said it's okay to support it that way. I think there is probably a dormant commerce clause violation because the suit was from out-of-state nuclear power plants saying we want some of those credits too because our nuclear power is coming into Illinois and coming into New York and you're not treating us equally. You're discriminating in favor of supporting your own in-state nuclear power and not out-of-state. The Supreme Court has, has ruled to the contrary, not with nuclear power plants, but with some other issues. So I think that's an interesting issue. But uh, there, there has been an issue, uh, a, a, an effort by the Trump administration to try to support coal and nuclear power plants, yet without great success, because they are reliable. They work around the clock. Wind and solar, it depends on the time of day as to what you get, and it's not always predictable. So it's an interesting issue there as to whether our reliability is hurt. Um, I do a lot of work overseas with renewables, and over there we're finding that, that we can absorb more uh, solar and intermittent power in the systems than is thought here, but I mean, our system's a little more complex, so I don't know. Yeah. Uh, any, any other questions? We'll, we have time for one more. All right. Got one. All right, I might have trouble uh, put, getting this across, but seems like a lot of the issue has to do with jurisdiction and whether the federal government or the state governments have jurisdiction over certain issues. For naval and maritime and admiralty law, there's a clause in the Constitution that gives the federal government power over that. Is this something where the, the progress of technology, understanding emissions, and on top of aviation in the last hundred years, an area where there might be somewhere where perhaps a constitutional amendment, we should give jurisdiction to the federal government where they have they have jurisdiction over emissions or the air quality and issues like that. So I, I don't understand the issue very well, but it seems like that's something that might create a solution. Yeah, I, I can try responding. Um, so you probably have you taken federal courts yet? I have. Okay. I mean, it's 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 very difficult. The, the Constitution cl clearly, at least in terms of current jurisprudence, gives a ton of power to the federal government under the Commerce Clause under a lot of the amendments, um, you know, under uh, a number of other clauses of the Constitution, gives the federal federal government a lot of power, and the federal government has, has taken that power, taken on that power over the years. So maybe folks on the panel will disagree, but I don't, 
I don't think there's any disagreement that the federal government has a huge role to play in protecting national security, safety, health, welfare, the environment. Um, I tell my students in my environmental law course that if you look at the way we were handling environmental problems prior to 1970 when all the major federal statutes were passed, you see a patchwork of, of terribly inefficient laws and some states had good laws and others had none. And in fact, most of the law was being made in nuisance suits because there wasn't any other you know, remedy. So um, if your question is, does the federal government does the, does, the, does the United States have the power and, and authority to regulate these? And yes, in a federal system, the states are not cut out if you, unless Congress says you're cut out. So, and I can put a footnote on that. Perhaps um, the um, ele electric power is the dominant sector of of CO2 emissions. Um, it's also, if, if you recall that uh, graph I had there, it's also two weeks ago what uh, Governor Brown in California and Michael Bloomberg, who's f former, uh, you know, New York uh, city official, uh, are, are arguing that we should take basically 90 percent of the changes out of the power sector, push that all to renewables. Um, the electric power sector is regulated uh, in federal law unlike everything else in the economy. Every wholesale transaction can only be regulated by the federal government. So whenever power is sold wholesale between utilities and the states have exclusive authority over the retail side of it. There's nothing else in the U.S. economy that makes a wholesale retail division. Um, Twenty-five years ago, only 8 percent of power was sold wholesale between utilities, between it was sold to you and me on a retail basis. Now, with deregulation in Massachusetts and 12 other states, 45 percent and climbing very quickly is wholesaled. Um, the electric utilities in the, in the six New England states don't own any power generation. They were all either incentivized or forced, depending on which perspective you take, to sell their power to the highest bidder. They have to buy it back each day to have any power to sell us. And so that changes from their owning the power facilities and it being only their retail sale to us, it changes it to a wholesale transaction. Federal government gets exclusive authority over the wholesale transaction, which is almost half now and climbing quickly. So in a way, the federal government has the authority, although you need somebody who needs to, to exercise it there. So the question is, it, you know, it's, it becomes political and, and I think, as uh, Jim said, a lot of this is very political. It is, it is interesting in the, the case that we keep mentioning that we didn't talk about, AEP uh, was sued, which is a huge uh, power, plant, uh, power company in the South, was sued by Massachusetts, Connecticut, and other states for putting carbon into the air by burning a lot of coal. Um, it was interesting to me that Massachusetts and Connecticut, when they sued, and the other states who sued here in the North, did not sue any of our own utilities who were burning coal at the time that that suit initiated. They only sued the big, co the big companies burning coal outside. So it does get very political, as you can see. Not that that was wrong, but it was interesting that it was a selective number of companies that were sued. So it, it, it's political, and I suppose if we could, the political system is, is better dealt with by the first and second branches, the executive and legislative, than the courts who are, you want one person or do you want a jury of 12 people making a decision? I'm not sure. Yeah. As far as the constitutional amendment goes, I, I, I think it's an intriguing idea for the next generation. I'm too tired to do it. <laughs> uh, but the, you know, there are um, 193 UN recognized countries. Uh, about 85 expressly recognize a right to a healthy environment. Eight, maybe nine now, um, uh, as I mentioned, recognize that the climate is something that the government should address in establishing policy. Uh, our Constitution is just about the most difficult Constitution to amend on the planet. You know, we've only, we only have 27 amendments, but we had the 11 that were kind of thrown in to ratify. So we're down to 16, one of which was repealed, so that makes it 15. And so we seldom do it. Most Constitutions are amended every, you know, all the time, on average one, once every 13 years, all across the, the world. But I think you raise, I think it's a great thing to end with, that if, if we can't get there, get there, meaning if we can't provide um, hope and um, a, a role for the rule of law in addressing climate change with anything else that we've come up with, not, not in the states, not the federal government, not in the courts, uh, not in the legislature, not with the executive, and just keep ping-ponging all of that, maybe, maybe it's worth a conversation, but that we couldn't even pass an equal rights amendment, came up three states short, doesn't give me much hope for that happening, at least in my lifetime. Well, uh, if we could just thank our panelists uh, and, and Lindsay one more time.
Uh, certainly, uh, one takeaway from the evening is that uh, this is a complex issue, very multifaceted, and uh, despite uh, having a ton of information uh, to digest from uh, the discussion, uh, it feels like we really just scratched the surface. Uh, the good news is we have food and beverages and time to chit chat some more, uh, so uh, please uh, uh, help yourself. Uh, I do just want to flag that we have some literature and some sign up sheets over on the table by the door. Uh, if